Well, Renee, thank you for a wonderful presentation covering a lot of ground, and I hope all of you saw how many examples she put forward of neuroscientists engaged in this area of understanding how sound and music have their interactions with the brain and can even be used for healing in lots of interesting ways that we are, I think, really exciting, excited now about being able to explore even further. So we have a little time for questions, and if there are people in Missouri who would like to uh, pose questions, there are microphones in the aisles. Uh, feel free to go and approach one. We also are now linked up to Facebook Live, so there are lots and uh, lots of eyeballs now watching this particular conversation, and they will be sending some questions as well. But I get to start, so that's part of the uh, opportunities here of playing Oprah in this particular format, which I always enjoy. So I'm interested, you said something that intrigued me and I suspect resonated also with people here in the process of trying to understand pain. Uh, you said that for you, the process of having to stand up in front of an audience, creating this sense of anxiety, even stage fright, was actually associated with the experience of pain as well. And yet, that was eased uh, as soon as you went out and began to perform. That is fascinating. Can you say a little bit yeah, more about and that? Yeah, it, it is. Uh, it was it was very troubling to me for a long time because it was actually it didn't even lift when I performed because you could chalk it up to distraction. It lifted just before, so um, there was definitely a sort of a, a strange little trade off there. If and, and I think I, I finally coined it as uh, I have to suffer in order to succeed. <laughs> So it was wow. bizarre. It was bizarre. And doctors in, in the early part of my career, it, it, mind-body connection was simply not acknowledged, really. And, and so, you know, I couldn't get any help with it uh, for a long time. Are you okay with our doing another study on you after that <laughs> particular report? It would be fascinating to see exactly what is that connection. And I'm sure it's not just you that's had that experience. How do you manage, uh, Renee, when you are called upon to sing at particularly emotional moments, and you were called upon a lot in that way, uh, singing You'll Never Walk Alone at the 9-11 Memorial, or more recently, singing Danny Boy at John McCain's funeral. How do you do that in a circumstance where there is such a powerful sense of what's happening all around you, and all eyes are on you, and you would think that if there was ever a hard time to hold it together, that would be it. How do you do that? Well, the hardest for me was at, on the, at the site of 9-11, a month after the attack, I sang Amazing Grace with an orchestra, and all of the families were lined up in the street in front of it, still smoking, uh, still spewing. And I, it was a lot of mental preparation. I just knew that this was about them and not about me. I hadn't lost anyone. Uh, and so I, it, it really took me. I was practicing in my house in Connecticut every night at 11 o'clock once the children went to sleep over and over and over again because I thought no matter how I'm feeling or how hard it is, this has to come out and it has to be right and not self-indulgent. So it's really mental preparation. Tell me a little bit more about your own childhood music training because one of the things we're fascinated by in our sound health studies is the growing evidence that early music exposure doesn't just prepare you to have the experience of music lifelong, it actually changes your brain in, in a way that we can see anatomically. If you take uh, 10 uh, MRI scans of individuals who had significant musical training before age seven, and 10 who did not, and ask an experienced radio a neuroradiologist to look, they'll figure out which are which. It has made a permanent change in the brain. I suspect your brain has been changed or you wouldn't be here, but tell me about that because your parents were music teachers. Well, it's interesting because I was very premature. In fact, the doctors told my mother not to, my parents not to hope. So it was, it was you know, it was borderline in those days. And, um, and I didn't speak until very, very late. So I, uh, I suspect that because I kind of sat under the piano while she taught voice and piano lessons all day for, until she became a public school teacher, that I, I just, it became my first language in a way. And we sang as a family all the time and performed constantly. She thought for sure we were going to follow in the fun traps uh, mold. And thank God my father said no. <clears throat> 
Well, say a little bit more about what did happen, because obviously there were many who grew up with this dream uh, of being a major figure on the operatic stage. It is a very uh, narrow passage to get through to that. You put uh, an incredible amount of discipline into that in order to arrive there. What was that all about? Well, it was really a step-by-step -step thing, because I, I didn't have this um, sing-or-die attitude. I wanted to be successful, and I wanted, and I have a lot of energy and drive, um, but it could have been in a, a number of different fields. Uh, but I, I just kept getting more and more interested. I had a Fulbright scholarship. I studied abroad. Um, so I learned to speak fluent German and other languages. That helped, and I, I, I just became more and more fascinated with the practice, the solitary uh, practicing of skills, because uh, the voice is a very unruly instrument. I grew up on horses. It's a lot like riding a horse. You just can't, it's hard to control. You never know when it's going to betray you and you're going to be off. So, and it takes a long time, about 10 years, to really master what, what it is that we need to do. And languages are a big part of this. I remember one time talking with you when you were trying to uh, learn something in Czech, which I don't suppose is necessarily easy to suddenly bring into your brain. And you told me uh, today that you're learning an even more difficult language, which is English as spoken in North Carolina. So, <laughs> so how does that work? And, and is it in fact true in your case that musical training also sensitizes you to word differences in languages that make it a little easier to tell the difference between North Carolina and South Carolina? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> if you have musical training as a young child, you definitely have a better ear for language, no question, because uh, my children, who also were trained in music and around music all the time, just picked up languages very quickly. Uh, so for people who need that, it, they, it, the two disciplines uh, really support each other well. So we have some questions that people sent in um, in advance because they knew you were coming and so we told them they could uh, submit something and I might maybe even ask some of them and <laughs> I'd like to. Uh, so here's one uh, from an unnamed person. Music may have a positive effect on the mind and thus on health. Perhaps you are biased towards classical music, but have you experienced any types of music that have an ill effect on health? <laughs> Be careful how you answer this. No, this Even is... in the classical realm, are, are some modern pieces with dissonant sounds not good for some people? So that's a great question. Um, well, first of all, I, my taste is extremely eclectic. I listen to all kinds of music. And when I talk about music in the arts uh, enhancing people's lives, I mean it's whatever they like and whatever is their taste. And that includes for children. Uh, it should, we should have the most uh, democratic, expansive view of what, uh, what it is that's moving to people. Um, and so uh, this about music being challenging, I'm told by some music therapists that in fact some patients might love heavy metal but it might not be the best for, thing for them in that moment. They might not want to get their heart racing and get sort of jazzed up in that kind of way. Um, so one is in music therapy is trained to be careful about what the result of music will be on the patient, even if it's something they really want. So there is that consideration, and certainly dissonance in classical music, um, we had a lot of uh, funny names for it. I mean, I happen to really love contemporary classical music, but it's, it's the audiences uh, typically have struggled in the 20th, 20th century and now 21st century. And in fact, I'm finding in the US in particular, music of, of, in, a, in a sort of modern classical vein is much more accessible, I find. I love it. I think you and I have talked about this interesting paper that was published in Nature a few years ago where they tried to figure out, do particular musical intervals sound pleasant or unpleasant because of the physics of the fact that they have uh, relationships in, in terms of their frequency that are actually precise integers, like an octave has a two to one interval between the high note and the bottom note in terms of the frequency, and thirds and fourths and fifths also have those kind of integer relationships. Um, but some of them don't. The, the devil's interval, if you play a C and an F sharp, it's like, oh, although it's wonderful to resolve the it. The tritone, right? Yeah, the tritone. Uh, <laughs> But they tried this out on individuals from other uh, fairly untouched civilizations that had not been influenced uh, by um, J.S. Bach or other particular <laughs> kinds uh, of uh, wonderful 12-tone scales. 
And they didn't really think there was anything bad about the tritone, which stunned me because I always assumed that this was on the basis of the physics of the way in which the sounds either fit together or don't. I obviously didn't understand this very well, or maybe the study was wrong. Uh, obviously, this must be something that composers think about a lot in terms of how to make the tones actually fit well together. Well, it's, it's, I'm glad you bring this up because uh, there's another uh, group of students at uh, MIT who are studying harmonicity in South America. And harmonicity is, in fact, the study of, of the overtones and, and more than just harmony. And what they've discovered is that uh, this is entirely cultural, what you're saying, which is why, for instance, there are smaller incremental uh, intervals in, uh, in, in India, for instance, where they have an incredibly high form of music making. And it's music that we in Western uh, classical music and in Western music find uh, not immediately easy to understand uh, or to reproduce, but um, it is highly complex. So it's, it's definitely what you've grown up with. That's what appeals to you. So some questions coming in from Facebook. Uh, one is, what do we know about music therapy and Parkinson's and other neurological conditions? Well, we have people in this audience who are probably quite expert on this. Certainly for Parkinson's, uh, the ability to use rhythm uh, to help people who are having difficulty in terms of walking, the initiation of, of walking, and then keeping up a steady pace as opposed to walking in very short steps, the so-called marche en petit pas. Uh, you have, I have seen videos of this, you may have as well, where just a metronome keeping a steady beat can have a profound effect on that individual's motor abilities. That is pretty striking. Again, synchronizing something that we thought was impaired by providing a little bit of an input in terms of a rhythm. Well, it's partly motivation, but it's also definitely the rhythm. So Bin Hu, who's a researcher at Cal in Calgary in Canada, has created an app uh, for Parkinson's patients that he can, where he can actually, it, it attaches to the thigh, it's run with an iPod or an iPhone, I think, and in real time, he can see how they're doing, and he wants to eventually connect this to 500,000 patients in China who have Parkinson's. Uh, and so that's extraordinary. The Ability Lab in Chicago has a different type of piece of technology which attaches to the whole hip, which does a similar thing. And we're going to find, I think, increasingly that uh, those types of, of uh, therapies can be used universally for uh, that type of nerve impairment. You can see why the honorary degree would have been appropriate here. <laughs> Renee is teaching me a lot of stuff I didn't know about things that people are already doing in this regard, which is pretty amazing. We, of course... I, I'm suppressing my d disclaimer I'm a singer, but <laughs> just, just pretending I belong here. So please correct me, please, afterwards. Come and find me. You know, Renee, we have a wonderful group of individuals now from multiple different institutes, uh, our Sound Health Working Group, that got started at that workshop that you mentioned in your presentation. Many of them are here uh, with us this morning, and they've been working hard to try to identify research opportunities where we could bring together maybe people who haven't learned to speak to each other effectively in terms of research, so the music therapists, the performists, the neuroscientists, they all have their way of approaching this. And I'm pretty excited about where that's going to go. And you mentioned we have this $5 million effort, which is in the not-too-distant future, going to give rise to some real awards uh, to do research that wouldn't have happened otherwise. What are your dreams of how that program uh, ought to shape up? What, what do you see from having watched this whole uh, field uh, is most needed, most uh, opportune? Well, I do think that therapies need to be shored up and, and, and increased research that, that supports them because I'm, I only talk about the things that I know to be uh, validated by the NIH. And certainly for childhood development, we could use some more um, proof that it is helpful and how it helps. We could certainly use for music therapy to be widely uh, reimbursed by insurance companies as, as other therapies are. Um, I would like to see us be thinking about what happens when robotization actually uh, reduces the number of jobs available to so many Americans. How are they going to fill their hours? What is the quality of life for all of us going to mean? I believe that the arts and other activities will be increasingly combined with health 
and our well-being and also the sense of community that I mentioned. So that is one thing to consider and also the use of AI and medicine, which I went to a conference not long ago with people who are very much high up in the business of health and I was amazed at how quickly they seem to think this is going to happen. Uh, we agree. In fact, that's one of the areas of greatest interest and enthusiastic support to expand what we can do to support uh, applications of AI uh, to medicine. In the longer term, we are likely, as maybe as part of this brain initiative, to really begin to understand how these circuits in the brain do what they do, and maybe even to have a detailed understanding of what happens when Renee Fleming is singing something that uh, lifts us all out of our seats and out of our persons, and then figures out a way to capture that and implant it in somebody else's brain. Are, are you worried about that? <laughs> as long as it is applied to my own performances, I think it's great. <laughs> and I want to thank uh, Bob and Emmeline, too, for fielding all of these opportunities in terms of nesting music research into these extraordinary studies you're all doing and working on here. Indeed. So exciting. They have worked really hard on this. Since I know there's people watching on Facebook, I can't help but also ask you your experience taking part in a clinical trial and uh, what that was like and what you might want to say to encourage all those other people out there who we may ask to take part in similar trials as we really try to understand how this works. Is this something that you survived despite those two hours in a, a tube? And is this the kind of thing that you think people should listen to if they get the chance to take part? Absolutely. I mean, first of all, I, I didn't find it uh, that hard at all. It's so interesting. I mean, the process is interesting and also uh, how Dave worked to kind of bring this to fruition and come up with uh, some sort of analysis because then everybody else who's doing this can also build on that. And I've been amazed at the amount of excitement around the country and in Canada having to do with having these new technology as an ever more powerful fMRI machines and MRI machines to be able to look at what makes us human what brings us together and what hopefully can create a better society. I mean, this is, this is me speaking as an artist. Uh, that's the uh, ultimate goal. Well, let me ask you as an artist, Renee, you've done this amazing set of things uh, in terms of your career in opera, which is how most people know you, but you've also recently morphed into a Broadway uh, artist in Carousel. I had the privilege with Diane of listening uh, to that performance, and I'm, I'm still taken by the way in which you transformed that uh, stage and all of us uh, by your performance as Nettie Fowler. Now I understand uh, you're rehearsing something that's going on to London. Where are you going with all this? What's the plan for chapter whatever it is, 10 or 11 now, uh, of Renee Fleming? Um, you know, I feel so grateful. I have had such privilege in my career and in my life. Uh, and to be able to sing on the world's greatest opera stages and with the world's greatest uh, orchestras in, in concert halls um, has been extraordinary and, and very rewarding. Uh, so I, now I'm doing a, a show opening the shed at Hudson Yards with actor Ben Wishaw, who is brilliant and to be able to sit across from him it's just the two of us for 90 minutes uh, reciting and acting out a very complex text by Pulitzer Prize winning poet Ann Carson and so that's been a new experience we end in a week and then I go to London for the light in the piazza which is a beautiful uh, very rich musical and the role I'm playing is one of the more complex interesting uh, women I've ever played so uh, next season I'm touring with Evgeny Kissin are uh, probably our, 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 well, possibly our greatest uh, uh, living uh, concert pianist. And we will tour Europe and we'll tour the US. So I hope uh, you'll come and hear us somewhere. So constant, still constantly working and feeling very happy that I am. I see we have a question here. Yes, sir. Um, yes, hi. Um, sorry. It's a pleasure to hear you. Uh, I've been a fan my whole life. Um, I'm a tuba player, and our god, if you will, is a guy named Arnold Jacobs, who you may have heard of. I played with Chicago for years. Sure. And what most people don't know about him is when he was a young man, due to a very bad habit, he lost half his lung capacity, which for a tuba player sounds devastating. And somehow, using his knowledge of the body and learning everything he could about how the body works and how it functions, he became arguably the single greatest tuba player that's ever grace this planet. I mean, he's phenomenal. 
Um, have you looked in or, I mean, I'm sure you know who he is, but have you looked in or, or studied any of the stuff that he did to overcome his deficiencies? And the man was phenomenal. So, That's amazing. I, you know, and also brass players often suffer from dysphonia and different kinds of other issues too. But that is really amazing. I know how much air they have to use to even create a single sound. And I just heard about a singer who lost a lung and is singing professionally. So, um, you know, the body, what we can do where there's a will, there's a way. Uh, and he is definitely proof of that. I will, I will look into that actually. I haven't sung with the Chicago Symphony in a little bit because I'm with Lyric Opera of Chicago as a consultant as well. So I'm I'm always there, typically, when I'm there. But I'll look into that. Thank you. There, I mean, another whole area of treatment is for artists. And, you know, Houston Methodist has a fantastic program. Uh, Roosevelt Hospital in New York has a great program. And we really depend on them. The things that they can do, it's extraordinary. Um, and there's a lot of brain surgery that helps people play better. There's been a violinist, a saxophone player. This is, and a singer. This is all on YouTube, by the way. These surgeries, these open, you know, awake surgeries. And you showed a photograph of yourself singing with a choir of individuals, and people might have noticed a couple of them in wheelchairs. Those were all people who had had strokes and who had lost their ability to speak normally, and yet there they are in, in the choir because of the ability to retrain uh, the brain to utilize the music pathway when the typical language pathway is impaired. That's one of the more powerful experiences that I've had is listening to that choir of individuals who maybe before they had that chance kind of thought they would have not been able to communicate even in language, much less in music, and there it was. Well, there seems to be a guitar here on stage. <laughs> So we have one more question, a standing oh, question. There's a question. Yeah, Jack, go ahead. Uh, 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 hi, Jack Snyder with National Institute on Drug Abuse. I, I had the great pleasure of, of seeing your play that you're in at the Shed last weekend and was so struck by the 90 minutes of very, very complex dialogue and music. I wonder if you could just briefly comment on your, your memory process and how it's <laughs> evolved over the years because we all of us could, could not believe how the two of you recalled everything that you said in 90 Minutes, which was clearly complex as, as well as singing. Thank you. Um, well, it, it doesn't get easier, I, I will say that. I mean, when I was- We can all agree. When I was in my 30s, I would learn 10 roles a year, sometimes seven roles a year, and some of them in languages I don't actually speak. And, and memorizing sounds by rote to sound authentic and look authentic is really <laughs> challenging. But, um, I, and this is a question I ask my colleagues a lot too, but you know, it's somebody, you have to come up with a system, whatever your system is. And then it really, I now know that if I, I have to get something to the point where it's muscle memory in order not to be, any distraction, it has to still be there. Um, but the musical side for me, interestingly, is very easy. I memorize music like that. It's because I've been doing it all these years. But now that I'm in theater and having to memorize dialogue, it's scary because there's nothing, if you skip a line, it's silent. <laughs> Whereas in opera or any kind of music, it's like a river. And if something happens, you just join the river a few bars later. <laughs> so theater is not like that. It's definitely challenging. Well, let's see if music will serve us well here uh, this afternoon. Renee has graciously agreed, having graced the stages of all the major opera houses and, and uh, uh, other facilities, uh, to check off one more place on, on, on her list of most desirable locations, Missouri Auditorium at NIH. So let's do this. Um, I just also want to thank you for everything that you do to improve the quality of our lives, and not just in the U.S., but in the world, um, improve our health. I mean, I'm just in awe of what you do. It is day in and day out so extraordinary and so amazing. And this is one reason why I'm passionate about this, because every day something new happens. Um, and I also want to thank the Kennedy Center for supporting this project and the NEA, the National Endowment for the Arts, who is supporting also tremendously this uh, project. So, Francis, thanks to you most of all. Uh, it wouldn't happen without you. Uh, we are partners. And, and how was it you said you dealt with stage fright? <laughs> 
Uh, we picked a song that helps me out because in the first verse, it tells you what chords to play. Literally, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, and the major lift. You know where I'm going here. This is Leonard Cohen's wonderful anthem, Hallelujah. I heard there was a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord. But you don't really care for music, do you? It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor chord, the major lift, the barefoot king composing a hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Your faith was strong. But you needed proof You saw her bathing on the roof Her beauty in the moonlight overthrew you She tied you to a kitchen chair She broke your throne and she cut your hair And from your lips she drew the hallelujah That song is um, so universal. It's amazing to me. It's one of about four things that I've sung over the years that everybody likes. Yeah, it's yeah. the only time ever in one of my concerts that people actually hold no lighters anymore, but their iPhones up <laughs> and start waving. You don't see that in, in classical concert halls too often. I heard uh, a recording of Renee singing this at a Memorial Day event, and so after today. You have to go and listen to that and hear how it's done when there's a full symphony orchestra and the most exquisite voice on the planet uh, raising the tones. Uh, this song, written in 1864, and it seems really appropriate for what we're doing here today because the title of this song is How Can I Keep From Singing? How can I 
keep from singing. What though the tempest loudly roars, I hear the truth, it shields me. But though the darkness around me close, songs in the night will heal me. No storm can shake my inmost calm, while to that rock I'm clinging, since love resolves. Singing. When tyrants tremble in their fear and hear their death knell ringing, when friends rejoice both far and near, how can I keep from singing? In prison cell and dungeon fire, our thoughts to them. I see the blue above it, and day by day this pathway smooths since first I learned to love it. No storm can shake my inmost calm, while to that rock I'm clinging. Since love rules over heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? How can I keep from singing? Hey. Thank you. Renee Fleming, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bravo. Yay. I'm just glad he doesn't ask me to do his job. <laughs> <laughs>